everybody. I'd like to um, welcome Stephen Perkin back Perfect. again. I got it right this time. Perfect. Stephen was here last year talking about the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, the Great Heist. Mm -hmm. You went and saw it? You went and saw the museum? I've been there. But we, you we didn't all went there the yeah, next right, day. Right, right, we right. We made right. a double header thing That's, for it. Yeah. Uh, good for you. Good baseball theme here. Yeah. <laughs> so Stephen is here to talk to us about Whatever. investigative reporting. Yeah. And he also just told me that he's going to have a podcast um, starting in September on, um, what's the sub subject? Uh, on the Garden Museum. On the Garden Museum. Yep. And it's a, a collaboration between the Boston Globe and WBUR. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the Boston Globe, Stephen is one of the original uh, Spotlight Team investigators. Mm -hmm. right. So right. we are Way very, back. very lucky to have Stephen yeah. here to talk with us Thank today. Thank you, Chris. And, um, Red Sox is going to be playing at 730. Yeah. So going. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Great to be here again. Um, yeah, it was uh, it wasn't meant to be for me to be a reporter. I should be up here talking about the law if I followed the uh, the course of my uh, my young adulthood. My mother told me she had been a librarian at the Boston Herald. And my mother said to me that uh, uh, you know, uh, you can write and you like people, you're engaging, but there's not enough money in reporting, so uh, you better get a real profession. And this is in the late 60s, uh, mid 60s, so I went to law school nights as I started out as a reporter after I graduated from BU. And it was terrific because the, the job was up at the State House in the uh, the uh, the night classes in law were at Suffolk, so I did that for four years. And midway through, I went from the State House News Service to the Boston Globe, and I was covering the Vietnam War protests. And for all of us who think of this is the worst, it's not. That was the worst. Um, uh, you know that the losses uh, of our brothers and you know sons and and best friends. It was um, it was incalculable, incalculable, and the country I do think in 1968 went through a nervous breakdown, which we really have never recovered from. By that I mean uh, trusted each other. Uh, we despite our politics. Um, a little louder. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I, uh, but I, I loved working at the Globe right away. I loved working, and I, they had me covering the Vietnam War protests, and I did that for about a year. And I got approached by uh, an editor, and he said, "Listen, uh, we'd like to make you staff reporter. You're doing very well, and uh, you can continue to cover cover the protests." So I, I went along with it and continued my law school, and I, they liked that. Uh, the Globe editors did so. Uh, in 69, the summer of 69 was the crucible year for my, for my career. And I always thought as I sat in my family's uh, uh, yard in, 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 in Plymouth, in Manomet, that the reason why that editor was calling me on that July uh, Sunday morning was because I had had four years of law school. And that's why he wanted me to go to Chappaquiddick to cover the accident the morning, the morning after the accident. But no, 20 years later or 30 years later, you so no, Steve, we sent you, we called you because you were the closest. <laughs> you were the closest to the ferry. <laughs> but be that as it may, you know, and I hope you've seen the movie because the movie really is terrific. No matter uh, what you felt, uh, what you feel, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the legacy of the Kennedys and Teddy Kennedy, uh, the movie does try as best they can to, I think, to cover the, the event fairly. And so I got down to the island, and uh, um, I called my editor, and I said, I'm going to go to the police station. He said, no, no, we ought to get somebody there. Do you know where you're supposed to go if the, the body's been taken off the island? So do you know where you're supposed to go? And I said, oh, no, where, John? And he said, you go to the medical examiner's office, Steve. And I said, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm four years of law school, and I know the criminal law procedure. But he's telling me what to do, and, oh, and what do I do there, John? He says, what you do is there is you ask for what the measure of her blood alcohol was. And I said, why? He said, because the body has been taken off the island, and all we're hearing from, uh, from the people who are at the party or the people who are close to the senator, and they're all saying there was very little drinking. 
Yet there were five married men, five unmarried women, and uh, we see here from a Newsday story, Newsday is a paper on Long Island, that they've taken out, they've found a, a big trash bucket full of uh, liquor bottles. But we don't know anything. Nobody's giving us any on-the-record information. The senator's gone back to his, his compound on, in Hyannis, and uh, everyone's left the island, and the body is gone. There's not going to be any autopsy. But, he says, my, this is my editor telling me, but, he says, there is a blood alcohol sample, and that will measure how much uh, alcohol she had in his blood. Go to it. So I went to the door around 2 o'clock in the af Sunday afternoon, knocked on the door of the medical examiner, and I asked him, and he was, he was in his bow tie, <laughs> his white shirt, you know, crusty um, uh, islander, and I told him who I was, Steve Kirk from Boston Globe, I'm looking for this. One second, he comes back, he's got his suspenders on now, but he also has his notebook. And he reads me the numbers, and the numbers were uh, her, that her blood alcohol level was 0.09. That would be drunk today. 0.08 is the drunk level. She had 0.09. Then it was 0.10. So we put that in the paper the next day. And the, the effect that that had on the spin masters, those people who were trying to say there was a minimum of drinking, stopped it. And uh, I got to stay on the island, got to see the whole, you know, the kind of reporting um, uh, that, uh, you know, investigative reporting I love to do. I didn't break any, any big stories, but that was enough. <laughs> so I came back and um, the editor says, listen, uh, you got to take a week off. You got to, we need, uh, everybody on the staff has to take a week off during the summer. The summer of 69, and I'm saying, well, I don't want to take a week off. I said, come September, I have to go back to law school nights. That's hard. I said, I have the best time just being in this newsroom, going out, covering stories, writing them up, put them in the paper, and seeing a name, you know, the, uh, you know in the paper under a story. And, uh, and I'm a Boston boy, born, born and raised in Boston, public schools of Boston, Suffolk, and PU. So I'm really in my element right in that newsroom. So he said, no, you got to take a week off. Oh, I rolled my eyes. So I got the paper, New York Times, where can I go, travel section. I look at the arts and entertainment section, and there's a, there's a music festival. And I was a rock and roller then, and I continue to be a rock and roller. And uh, music, uh, there's a festival on upstate New York, and uh, 80,000 people <laughs> so, <laughs> there. So I said, uh, this sounds like fun. You know, three days off, and you know, I said, bring your, bring your uh, sleeping bag, it's fine. So um, I call, I get, I think the tickets were $12, or maybe $30 for three days. I said to the, uh, the copy uh, uh, assistant beside me, I said, listen, Mark, I'm going up, and he came from Adelbar. I said, I'm going up to this, you want to come? He says, yeah, let's do that. He was a big doper, I'm, I'm not, but he was a big doper. <laughs> so he, we went up there, and uh, there's a reason I'm telling you this story. We get there, and we see not 80,000. In fact, all the fences are down. There is a traffic jam that we had to abandon my car, my two-cylinder Saab. <laughs> it made it back and forth. And uh, we got there, and we got out of the car, and we started walking and walking and walking, and jump on a car, a fire truck going up there, and we finally get there around 5 o'clock at night. And we see, I mean, eight, 400, and then probably 300,000 people kids and uh, it's amazing and I said I remember saying to Mark I said Mark this is a story you know I hadn't I thought it was just going to be a music festival but it, now it changed into something a story and I'm a reporter you know the fire alarm is going off in the newsroom I'm thinking so I say I, I better check in and he says Steve that's your you go ahead. I'm going to have fun. We'll, I'll catch up with you at the in the press room and the press office, press tent. It was a, it was literally a press tent this size, the size of this room, rows and rows and rows of tables with PR releases on every group that was there, and there's one woman at the front and no one else is in the room. Why? Because the other reporters hadn't gotten there. They hadn't been able to trudge the 15 miles yet. You know they were still waiting. 
But there was a helicopter up in the air. The AP had had a helicopter, so um, which was reporting back the size of the crowd and no one seemed to be in charge. So I get on the phone, I ask, can I use your phone, please? Call the Boston Globe City Room and I, I get patched into the rewrite guy and he says to me, start filing. And start filing means start reporting. Give me the information so I can write the story from here. So I said, Jimmy, I said, what, what do you want? What's going on? Because I didn't know anything. I wasn't listening on, it wasn't, I was listening to music, I guess. It wasn't anything on the radio. He says, Steve, they're shutting it down. The Governor Rockefeller is sending in the troops. It's turning into a Vietnam War protest. They're afraid people's lives are in danger. There's going to really be something special. I said, Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. <laughs> This is not a Vietnam War protest. These are their younger brothers and sisters. They're here to smoke dope and listen to Santana. They're not here. They are not here to, these are not protests, it's not. He says, well, that's what the AP is reporting. The governor has shut down the throughway, the exits to going into this, uh, into the site. So it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna go on. They're gonna cancel, they're gonna, they're gonna postpone it. They're going to shut it down. I said, I don't think so. He said, well, get me some information. So I go down. I think it was the only time I got to the bandstand. I went down and I got one of the organizers, told him who I am. And, you know, there is like a, you know, if you're a, you know, a, a doctor or a lawyer, you, you would pronounce yourself with your profession. And for reporters, I'm Steve Kirkton from the Boston Globe, and I want to know, dot, dot, dot. I've always considered that the most... Um, the most powerful sentence in the world, at least in America, because we have a free press. And when you're there, uh, -huh, mouth open, asking fair, you know, relevant questions, you get answers. So he say, I tell him who I am and that the governor is sh shutting you down. What are you going to do? He said, hey, no one's shutting us down. We're going on. If they try to shut us down, that these kids will go crazy. We're going on. They were supposed to start, I think, at five, and they started at seven. So I went back, called my rewrite reporter back in Boston, and filed in our stories. I got home, you know, a week later, uh, covered it for four or five days, and there was a letter from a woman who said, your story is the only one from the outset that was fair in telling the, in non-explosive. Um, you know, you, you were there. And I, I felt by being there, as I went home that night, I said, as I went home after the, the whole, um, after the whole uh, concerts, I thought to myself, you know, there's something about being at the event that you can get. And that has stood me well. Uh, and that's what we as reporters do. We go to the front and, you know, you, you, you try to figure out what happened, who was involved, how many people were hurt, and, and what's the significance on it, and you f put it in the paper the next day. And we have uh, standards that we have to meet, standards of fairness and thoroughness. And uh, that always seemed to me to be the hallmark of the best reporting. And the Globe was always uh, urging their, its, our, its reporters to be more thorough and more fair, and by that I mean more reporting, going out and saying, this is what I've found, tell me if I'm right, if I'm on the right, uh, right uh, path, and if not, why not? Uh, so that you are not talking from up on, on high, and you're not talking in the weeds, you're talking to people directly. And, um, and it was a hallmark, and I think a year or two later, um, when they put me on the spotlight team, I had passed the bar and I was thinking about, you know, going off into, into um, you know, into the law. I, I, I decided not to. I, I did never have as important effect on my community, uh, uh, Boston being my community somewhere I grew, had grown up in, and sort of um, carry out the purposes of what I would hope to be a good citizen, uh, like I would do it as a reporter, um, uh, then, then, then as a, then as a, um, then as a, uh, as a lawyer. You know, it's a testament 
by what we do. This I'm Steve Kirkson from the Boston Globe, and I won. And it's not the Steve Kirkson, and it's not even the Boston Globe. You know, it's the Attleboro Sun. You know, it's the Dedham Transcript. It's the weekly that that gets you know dropped off once a week at at your home. And those reporters are out there trying to cover their community the same way the Globe we do at the Globe and at the New York the New York Times. You know. Um, the, 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 there was great responsibilities on us as reporters and papers to get it straight. And I know uh, with uh, President Trump's um, uh, accusations of, of, uh, of um, fake news and, um, and also enemy of the, of the people, it's a very, very damning and uh, to um, someone like me, or me, uh, who has spent their life in this in this business, uh, the uh, the 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 goal that I, you know, President Trump, you know, talks about the Second Amendment all the time, and he never talks about the First Amendment, and that's the amendment that gave gives me the right to walk up and ask to the sheriff, ask to the mayor, ask to the police commissioner, go into a community, no matter how, you know, in turmoil it is, and say, I want to know. And um, that goes back to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, President, um, that, that's an amendment that allows us freedom of press, but it also allows us freedom of religion. Uh, a peaceably assemble, right to grieve, it, grieve what's going on in government. It's all in that First Amendment. The Second Amendment says you can rule by the power of a gun. It really is that you know, uh, no, Congress will make no law that'll abridge the the right of the of the people to uh, own and, and 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 possess guns. That's fine. And the reason why that's there, even. Not for a, for a well-regulated militia is to allow us to rebel in the streets. Jefferson said, "There will be blood in the streets every 20 years, because the minority is not going to be able to get their side across. And when the minority can't get their side across, get their policies, their positions, their fervor heard or, or, or felt by all of us, they're going to take to the streets." That hasn't happened in you know, all these years, these hundreds of years, that hasn't happened. It's so rare that that has happened, that as people have taken to the streets with their guns. Why? It's because of the First Amendment. Jefferson also said, if I had to choose between a government and a free press, I'd choose the free press. Why? Because the free press takes the pressure off of the people to have to go to their guns. A free press will allow the other side to get their side, their positions across. And with that free press, with that ability to get the, their side across, if we're doing our job, and we can debate that, if we're doing our job properly, then the other side is going to be able to take control, become a majority party, and get their side, and get their, poli get their side heard, and get their policies heard. So mm -hmm. it's a very important that free press in the ongoing uh, process of government, yet um, the president, President Trump, um, uh, 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 in his in his wisdom, uh, decided to call us um, enemy of the people. But I, I want a much a much more um, uh, celebrated journalist than me. In fact, he was my buddy. He was my editor for several years at the Globe, Marty Barron, who now works at the Post, he had this to say uh, a few months ago when that enemy of the people was first came out. He said, only four weeks into his administration, President Trump labeled us the enemy of the people. By late summer, last summer, he questioned our patriotism. He said, I really don't think they like our country. And by the end of the year, 2017, he was calling the media a stain on America. President Trump's first full day in office, 
He went to CIA to declare himself at war with the media. And indeed, he has been. Statistics about uh, President Trump's tweets capture the unrelenting nature of the assault. Since he declared his candidacy in 2015, he has posted more than 1,000 tweets critical of the press. From 16 to 17, Trump tweeted about fake news more than 150 times. All this in the United States, which historically championed press freedom, is a foundational principle that truly made America great, inspiring people around the world seeking free expression of their own. Chris Wallace, who I hope you watched on Sunday mornings, but on Fox News, has declared President Trump is engaged in the most direct, sustained assault on a free press in our history. I think his purpose is clear, a concerted campaign to raise doubts when we report critically about his, in, his administration that we can be trusted. The observation, and this is, con, continues to be uh, Mr. Mr. Barron's observation, the observation of Yale professor Timothy Snyder apply here. Quote, to abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then no one can criticize power because there is no basis on, on, upon which to do so. If nothing is true, then all is spectacle, unquote. So, you know, here we're in this sort of uh, free fall where, and it's nothing new that the press gets uh, beaten up. Um, that we're not doing good enough job. But I've always found that, you know, the criticism is well, uh, well, well uh, painful to hear. No one wants to be criticized from their work. In fact, there's a basis for that. We haven't done enough good reporting. We haven't talked to enough people. And let me tell you, I think that, that can, you can say that that was a, a, a fair criticism of the press in the election of 2016. We were all stunned. The papers were stunned. And I still don't know how the, how the polls got it so wrong. Either we weren't talking to the people or we, like, the, uh, like Hillary Clinton's campaign, were not going to those states in which there was a real battle and she wasn't doing enough hard work to, to, to win. So, um, but, uh, but we didn't. That's fair. But to hear the president uh, aim such withering criticism uh, upon us. It, it's what we're, we're going to get up in the morning and we're going to go in and put out the best paper we can by the same standards we've done for more than 100 years. But to think that he is turning people at, towards us to question our motives and our principles, uh, it does the country no good. It does us no good, but certainly does no country no good. What do we do but we inform the public? upon what's going on in the community. You know, this, um, this, uh, my response is to appeal to the public to understand what we do in the media. We're an independent force that informs the public about the activities of government. When there's tyranny involved, or when there's corruption involved, or when there's inefficiencies involved, the press is there. Without the press, there'd be no focus turn of the century on the robber barons whose excesses led to the controls on Wall Street in the U.S. tax code. Without the press, there'd be no exposure of child labor laws that were putting children as young as 10 years old at work in industrial mills outside of Boston. Without the press, there would have been no coverage of the excesses of the food industry in the early 1900s that exposed unhealthy conditions in ch at the Chicago's slaughtering plants. Without the press, there would have been no printing by the New York Times or the Pentagon Papers that exposed the wrong decisions of the Vietnam War. And without the press, there'd be little impetus to the civil rights movement that called attention to our black population continuing to live as second-class citizens 175 years after Jefferson had written, all men are created equal. I mean, to, to, to think of uh, the stigma, his attempt to stigmatize us, it w I, I think if we were in a better position um, financially, uh, the press, if the people were picking up the Globe or the, the Herald or the New York Times, as they had been when it landed on our, on our doorsteps with a thud, and it doesn't, it's not landing on far fewer <laughs> doorsteps these days, 
uh, now. Um, but people still read us. People still, but do they depend on us? Do they see us as uh, trying to get the story as researched as, as fully as possible? That's my concern. That's where I think his criticisms uh, have a very, very damaging effect. And the damaging effect on us, yeah, it makes my job harder, our job harder, but it, um, but it also takes away from when you read something and forget what you're reading about um, the, the president of North Korea. When you're reading about uh, Fox, uh, 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 Gillette Stadium's expansion and you say, well, can I trust this? Is this really what's going on? I mean, that's the news that really matters to us. You're from your local to your city to your state. That's absolutely important. But when you start questioning whether the reporting is accurate, then really the bulwark of what, how our democracy works, by which news media informs the public so you can make better decisions, that is, bega becomes to be deteriorated. And, and, that's, and that's, that's my great concern. Um, I, I wanna hear from you as to what you, you folks feel about uh, your coverage, your coverage here in Norfolk. Uh, in um, Norfolk County and uh, in, the, in these re this region around here, but also the state, and let's also mix it up on the on the president's politics. I, um, I my my lasting, you know, my my family has a um, has the conversations as well as each of yours. Though uh, the president has provoked something. Um, which I think could be good. You know, if we can, we never talked about race, you know, which has always bothered me. We never were able to figure out how best to talk about race, it was just a taboo. Um, but I, if we could talk about politics and try to gain some respect or regard for one another through that discussion, I think this country um, becomes closer, comes stronger. Uh, not that we need to agree. We don't want agreement. I want dissent. I want to mix it up. It's only when you tell me something you're able to convince me. It's when we're all saying the same things that I don't learn anything or we don't learn anything. But if we have respect and regard for one another as Americans, that discussion does not end with bitterness. That, that, that discussion ends with understanding. And, um, you know, we get, you know, we get some uh, difficulties. And, but I think the great difficulty we face as a people is being able to talk to each other openly and, um, and, with, and with understanding. If we can do that, if we can get that better, uh, then I think the problems, you know, then I don't distrust the other side when they say, I'm going to cut this program. And the other side doesn't say, well, I don't distrust that we're going for, we're going to fund that program. Um, you know, it's all, it's our, all our tax dollars at work. And, um, and uh, I'm ready to, uh, uh, to, 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 to hear the other side, but I just need to hear them. And I need to know that when I speak, the other side listens to me with as much regard as I'm listening to them. There is a higher good here, and that is uh, for America to come together and hear each other better than we have been doing, because we have not been doing it uh, since this campaign started. Well, thank you for letting me pontificate here for a few minutes. I'd like to hear from you guys as to what you have to say. Thank you, my friend. It would seem that even before uh, the issues of President Trump, the press has been somewhat handicapped, at least the, the, the print press has been somewhat handicapped by the change in advertising revenue, which has cut you guys back. Terribly, I mean, yep. There aren't that many of you anymore. Right, right. And so therefore, what information you can provide is restricted. Right. Uh, Fewer reporters. Yeah. Right. That's a handicap. Uh, and I don't know whether the Henry... Um, regime has helped or hurt that, yeah. but um, it's 
And it's not unique to the globe. No, it's not. Uh, the globe's uh, um, numbers are down dramatically, but let's uh, use the measure that you asked as reporters. The the newsroom that I left in 2007 had appro approximately 500 people, reporters, editors, photographers, um, designers, just a lot of people, uh, and we had bureaus throughout the world, as well as probably an eight-person staff in um, in Washington. Uh, and it was important. I was the Washington bureau chief for six, seven years, and while I had a terrific time, I knew that if one of you called my editor at the Globe and said, why isn't the Globe covering, I was gonna hear from him or her, and which meant your voice was being heard in Washington. We don't have that kind of staff now. So there is, that is a detriment on it. So today it's half of that. And the foreign bureaus are gone. We do send on major catastrophes, or major, you'll probably send somebody for the royal wedding. Um, but um, <laughs> we said, when Princess Diana, uh, you know, uh, had had awful, awful accident, fatal accident, we sent three reporters, you know, yeah. It's, um, I called, I said, I was on Nantucket, I was close, could I, could I go? No, you stay right there, you stay right there, Kirkson. <laughs> so, um, and our, our, foreign, our foreign bureaus have been all uh, cut. We do have three or four, four reporters and try to get the right stories for us in Massachusetts, in New England. Uh, out of Washington, but uh, there's so mu much fewer reporters. But with directed good editing, you can direct the reporters to the right stories. The Globe prides itself in doing, continuing to do investigative report. But those investigative reports come maybe once a month or once a week in the Sunday paper. You're not seeing it on a daily level. Uh, our State House Bureau has been. Uh, dro dropped by one or two reporters. That takes away from us. And, but the, and, the, and the reason is the advertising. We haven't, or the business hasn't figured out, we have more readers online. We have more readers now than ever. But the readership that comes online does not bring the bucks that the newspaper did. A full page ad in the Globe, and you know, we used to make money. Those classified ads, I mean, we owned that business. You know, help wanted, apartments, houses for sale. Um, you know, if you, whenever you were looking for a job or selling your house, whatever you're doing, uh, you, you had to get to a classified. That's all gone. That's all gone to the websites now. And to buy an ad in the Globe now is just far less cost, far less cost. so that's less revenue. I, I think uh, uh, Henry and Linda Pizzuti, Henry, his wife, are committed to the globe, uh, but they have a deep pocket. I think they, hopefully they will not be further, uh, another proof to the old adage, how to become a millionaire, be a billionaire and buy a newspaper. <laughs> that's, that's how to become a millionaire. So I don't, I, I, I he is, he, prides himself, I think, of being uh, a, a public citizen. So I think he gets something out of that. Uh, and his wife is tremendous. She's involved in daily coverage. I mean, she, she's fine with, uh, wouldn't this make a good story, or wouldn't make that make a good story. She doesn't, imp she doesn't press her, uh, her, uh, her, uh, her, uh, her decisions on the editorial staff, but she has, she has, she has issues that she voices. Chrissy? Can you speak to um, Sinclair Broadcasting and also cuts to um, public radio and public television and how that affects the Can you give me the first part of that again? I'm sorry. Uh, Sinclair Broadcasting. Sinclair? Right. Uh-huh. They, they, it's a company that I believe has purchased a large amount of um, syndicated uh, right. TV stations. Right. So More right wing? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'll just talk as a, as a viewer. Um, I, I like watching Fox because then I'm, because I'm not getting the Fox voice take on it, T A K E, you know, the angle on it from uh, CNN or the networks. The networks are try, but they don't have any attitude. CNN has a bit of an attitude. 
but I don't get any or much of the take on things, uh, the positive side on the president that I want to hear. You know, you just give me the spin. Let me hear it that I don't get it uh, on CNN. And, you know, uh, I think that CNN is talking to their uh, base the same way the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are talking to their bases. And that doesn't that doesn't that just keeps us in talking to ourselves. And I don't think I mean, you see those four or five people. You know, what's the story? The, the apology to uh, John McCain, to John McCain. Okay, that was on for three days. It may still be on because that was, you know, I didn't need to hear it day in and day out. I understand. You know, I've made my judgment against the, the, the White House and that woman for what she said. I don't need to hear it every day, every hour after. And I certainly don't need to hear talking heads saying the same thing. I want news. So take the money you're spending on the big bucks that you're spending on those four or five people around the table parroting each other and get pay reporters out there to do better reporting. Better reporting on things that matter to us. The environment, health care, the impact that that's having on us. The cuts that are, go that are going on in education that are, affect us. You know, I know we're lazy and nice to listen to say people saying things that we agree with, but that doesn't help us. Uh, it doesn't help our community and the community that we're paying for. You know, we're, t we're paying for the education. We're paying for the environment. You know, we're paying for the health care. Well, tell me how those cuts or if money is going to it, how that's to, to, to my public advantage. I'm not hearing that. So... Um, uh, I, I, I worry about that. We're not doing as good a job as we should be doing. We cover scandal great, but we don't cover what I think is service-oriented stories, the stories that affect more affect our lives than, than any scandal that's going on. My friend? A couple of things. One, I was at Woodstock. I got there a little bit before you did. Yep. Uh, Richie Havens opened up and he said there are 150,000 people. Uh, there are more people here than I'll play for in the rest of my uh, life. Uh, terrific. Unfortunately, he was right. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was. It was. He was. He was a terrific performer. Uh, uh, it, was, it was magic. Yeah. Um, are you on you any magic dust at that point in time? <laughs> <laughs> I, I inhaled. Yeah. I, I uh, so tell us, how did you drive up from here? Uh, I lived in New York at the time. Yeah. A friend of mine called me up the night before. He'd been working in Virginia and said, we're going to this rock festival. We're going to camp out in your backyard. I live in, in Mamaroneck, New York. Yeah, so you're close. And, and uh, I said, mm, sure. Yeah. And I told my father uh, that I, when I just stopped working for the summer, that yeah. I was going to go to this rock festival. Yeah, yeah. Seven dollars. Uh, the tickets were seven bucks each. You, no one ever had to... You still have I had them. My house was robbed. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Uh, it was magic. But yeah. I saw. No, I didn't take anything else. I saw four people carried up the hill to the medical. Yeah. Right. Right. In various states of Canada. Uh, and I said, I don't think I need to try no, that. <laughs> uh, but it, it seems that the great dichotomy between the political establishment and the free press really started with Richard Nixon. Uh, when Watergate started going to hell in a handbasket, well, first it was the Pentagon Papers, right. which revealed the duplicity right. of uh, the country's policies. Democratic and, and Republican. Of yeah. both, both parties right, equally right, killed right, right, in, right. in that respect. Leading up to Watergate, of course, and it was it Ron Ziegler, Ron Nessen, Nixon's press secretary? Yeah, Ziegler. Saying, getting up and saying with a straight face, all prior statements on Watergate are inoperable. <laughs> no, not operable. Whoa. <laughs> Followed with Jerry Ford and whip inflation now buttons. Yep. To Ronald Reagan and Iran Contra. Right. And in the background, you had the murmurings of the, quote, silent majority. Uh, 
you had the Iran Contra with with Reagan, which was horrible. You had hostages for arms. You right, had, right, right. With, with President with Warren. President Carter. It established an us. Yep. Versus that, yeah, them. right, right. The, the press, in large part, the big lie. You you repeat something long enough, people start to yeah, believe it. Right. The press was no longer seen as a guardian of truth, mm. but as a promulgator of rebellion, mm -hmm. of um, dissent. Dissent. Um, more than dissent, of, of disloyalty, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, dissent became disloyal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And our country was founded mm -hmm. on a dissent is loyalty. Right, right. And the juxtaposition, and now you have fake news, even when the, I mean, it's... Ronald Reagan's Teflon presidency has expanded. Mm. Uh, Clinton was largely untouched with all the, I mean, you know, they investigated him forever. Right. Yes. King Star went yeah. But the damage <clears throat> was done. Uh, no one believes anything you guys write mm. because you all have an agenda. Right. The the more liberal, more progressive. The agenda used to be seen as mm -hmm. truth. Right. I see a point. Yeah. Whereas not, it's not now. No. We're looked at very suspiciously as being far too progressive, far too liberal, far too involving ourselves in scandal. When, in fact, there is a lot of scandal to become involved in, right, but right. it's like too much muchness. Mm -hmm. Almost. Well, my my my. Um, there is no way. The the public is burned out on outrage. There, right. there is no outrage. And my antidote, respect. my antidote is that for us to go back to covering the things that matter, and to be known for covering of education, covering of health health care, covering of safety, and covering of the environment, and um, that could because therefore we're not. Covering scandal, we're covering for the government failings to give us the service that we're paying for, and that's we're not speaking for one party or another. We're speaking to other people. So um, I've long been an advocate that you know you looking for stories, don't go to the state house, go to the neighborhood councils, go to the precinct centers. Those are the ones who know what's going on. So. Hold, hold on, just one. Oh. I, 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 sorry, I, I did think that, that that's a terrific quote. We're no longer uh, the, uh, the guardians of the truth. You know, we, we, we're seen in another way now. And that's, we, lo we lose something with that. We lost something. So, my friend. You have 351 towns here. And the first casualty of the internet was any local reporting, any local coverage whatsoever. It's gone. You know, Walpole Times still in operation? Did you have a, a newspaper ever that covered Norfolk? Because you don't now. Mm. Nothing covers local politics. And they're as corrupt as the people are at the top. It's where it starts. Uh, and that's, you know, we all mourn that. Yeah. Yeah, there's all to be mourned, and no matter how often you go to a board of selectmen or a planning board or whatever it is, you get this. You get you you do. If you go too often, you get seen as a crank, and therefore someone whose voice cannot be trusted. And the only way to do it is to be able to bring it. Or one of the ways it used to be done, you bring your stuff to a reporter. She goes through it, looks at it, says, "Well, gee, that's that's interesting data." And there's some people who have been involved in it, suffered from the lack of the taking away of uh, um, full uh, uh, all day take, uh, all day kindergarten. It shows what has happened to our test scores when you take away all day kindergarten. You can follow that. Therefore, all of us read that say, "It's going to cost me more money, but I can see the effect." Let me let me speak up. Uh, the Globe or the Herald, now they can't afford to send reporters. Well, don't worry here. about sending. Oh, we can send here. You pick up the phone. Yeah, yeah. You pick, we have a South Bureau. You pick up the phone. 
It seems also not only are their staff limited, but their attention is limited. Uh, you may be right. We may be, you may be right. Uh, does somebody have a question over here? No, I have a comment. Please. Oh, I didn't, did you point to somebody else? I'm sorry. No, I, I, I saw you. I apologize. No, no, no. Um, I think town meeting is a good place to go and verse and voice your opinion. Um, and granted, there's always one or two that kind of monopolize it. So sure. it's on the same idea as you were just saying. Yeah, right. But it, it is a good way, and I think more people should attend. I hear you. What's, what, what is your attendance like? It's enough. Is it Norfolk you come, you go to? What is your attendance like? Oh, it was a pretty big group um, the last time. It's at more than 100? No. Oh, more yeah. than 100? Yeah, it was about 250, I think. Well, that's terrific. Yeah. That's terrific. And is there, is there not a paper that, that covered what went on there, at least on the major issues? I don't know about that. You don't know. And is there a website that covers... Is there a website that covers Norfolk? It seems to be about two years dead. Did for a little while. They did. So it's a community site. Yeah, right, right, right. The that Sun you could at least Chronicle. say again. The Sun Chronicle covers. I had a up. Yeah. yeah, well, that's good. They, and do they have a regular reporter assigned here? They have a bureau in Foxborough that comes down here. We, got one we don't guy know. In Foxborough. Huh? I got a guy in Foxborough. Well, he, he should be your best friend. He should be, you should always be, uh, or she should be your best friend. Uh, because those people, their job is to keep their ears open and look for the next best story. And the next best story comes out of your neighborhood. You know, when that accident happened, and you've complained that there's been, I've, you've talked, you've, you've petitioned the town for three years to get a stop sign at the end of your street because the school bus kids, picks up kids there. And God forbid an accident happened that could have been stopped, prevented from a, from a school bus sign, right? That's, that's a scandal. And when you're on the phone telling that reporter that that accident wouldn't have happened, those kids wouldn't have gotten hurt that act, be, if there had been a stop sign, that we asked for for three years. Let me tell you, you know what this means? That's a story. And that's a story that makes the political structure from the president down to the selectmen. Uh, uh, pay attention. We, we vote them out. We've got, ultimately, we've got the power uh, with the vote, but we, the, the, it's a newspaper's job to be, in, to be informing us as to what's really going on. Come on. Can you address a little bit about the spotlight? Aren't you nice? Church? Oh, aren't you nice? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, uh, my, that was my third Pulitzer. What had happened was I had been working on Father Porter back in the 90s. You guys are from Attleboro, Fall River. Remember Father Porter was a scoundrel down there. He had come from Revere. And uh, somehow he got put on. And, and I think for a little bit, O'Malley, Cardinal O'Malley had been his bishop. Um, so uh, story breaks. There are 20, at least more than a dozen, Victims who have filed suit against the church because of Father Oma Father, me, because of Father Porter's um, abuse of kids from parish to parish to parish. So I get on it, the Globe gets me on it, and uh, I got to have a couple of other reporters working with me. And I'm saying this has got to be more. There's got to be more. So we keep on it. We keep pressing. Keep pressing. We find a couple of priests up in Worcester who had done bad things. We put that in the paper. But what we didn't realize is the Cardinal, Cardinal Law, had put in place a new policy. And that policy was not really to question the allegation of the victims coming in. The victim could come in, and we found that the victims were not raising false allegations. These were people who had been living or suffering from the trauma of being abused as people, as kids, um, in dozens of uh, parishes around Boston, throughout, throughout Greater Boston. And, but we stopped getting tips about them. So 2002, or 2001 really, uh, the um, columnist for the, the one other uh, lawyer has about a dozen uh, victims of one priest, Father Gagan. And uh, the then editor, Marty Barron, whom I quoted here at length, he assigns the spotlight team. Go take a look at that. 
and they take a look at it, and they find that the, uh, the, the archdiocese, Cardinal Law, and his lawyers had put a seal on all of the papers that were being filed in that case. He, he had requested that all the papers be sealed. And so the Globe sued to get those papers open. And the Spotlight team, the four reporters on it, I don't know if you've seen the movie Spotlight, it won 2005, uh, 2015, excuse me, Academy Award. Well, in that, in that movie, there is one scene that um, I feel so proud about but then feel so short-served uh, uh, short on. The female reporter, uh, played by Rachel McAdams, walks up to a priest, and it looks like South Boston, knocks on his door, says, Father Paquin, I'm uh, Sasha Pfeiffer. I want to know why did you abuse kids? And he confesses, confesses. She takes it out and puts it in the paper. Well, it wasn't Rachel McAdams, it wasn't Sasha, it was me who walked up those steps. The reason why they didn't give me credit for it because it had happened after the first series had been in the paper. So I, they had brought me down and said, Steve, you know about this, we're getting lots of tips on these other priests and we could use your hand, could use your help in seeing if the stuff is true. I, when I had done my reporting in 10 years before, I had only got tips on one or two. The Spotlight team was causing dozens and dozens and dozens of tips to come in. But with every one of those allegations, the person would not tell us, would not go on the record that yes, they had been abused. Why? Because each of them had gotten a settlement from the archdiocese. And that settlement had a provision. If they speak publicly about it, then they, they'll lose their money. No way the church was going to take back their money that they paid to these people, but that was their fear. So what I had to do on this one was get a confession. So I was sitting outside the priest's home. Uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and I was listening to then mayor, uh, no, she, former mayor Flynn, who had been our Vatican ambassador. And Flynn, whom I like, <laughs> You know, was saying, no, that story Spotlight did on that Father Gagan, it's just a bad apple. This is not a systemic problem. And I knew from my reporting 10 years before and the tips Spotlight was getting from the original Father Gagan story that there were dozens and dozens. This, this was a pervasive problem. So now this other priest who had been accused walks up his front steps and he had been, he was no longer in the church. He was able to do some uh, ceremonies, but he wasn't able to give the sacrament. So I walked up behind him and I said, uh, Father Paquin, I'm Steve Kirchner from the Boston Globe, and I want to know that, again, this is what you do. This is what you're supposed to do. This, uh, and he said, I can't talk to you. And I said, Father Paquin, unless you talk, this scandal is going to go on and on and on. We need good people who, who have suffered from this abuse, cycle of abuse, to talk. I need to know, why would you abuse kids? I need to know that. And I need to hear from you on the record. And he looks at me. And I, it just turned out I had addressed it to the right person. And he said, you want to know? You want to know why I did it? And I said, that's why I'm here for and he went inside and he brought out a, a, um, a big file of papers. And it turns out, as he told me, he himself had been abused as a kid by a priest. And yes, he had fell into this cycle. I didn't get, ever get the psychology right. But as he said, listen, I want to tell you, I never got pleasure from these kids. I gave pleasure. Figure it out. But, it's, but, it, but it, at least it was acknowledgement. So I was able, we go, we had another story, another story, and we stayed on it for more than a year. It's the single biggest story that I think uh, that a local newspaper has ever done and had the most effect. Some people say, you know, you know, we went overboard, uh, but uh, and it changed people's, we did more harm than good to change people's O obeyance, not obedience, but faith in their church was a harm. 
you know, uh, wherever I see secrecy, I say there's a problem. Uh, and so that's, you know, I'm not Catholic. The, all the other the team members were Catholic, but I was not. Uh, I am not. And they, um, uh, it's just where you have private, where you have such closed system where you cannot get information um, about how many other priests are being accused. Had that been somewhere put on record, it never would have happened. They, the reason, the base, the, 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 the core reason that this happened was because clergy had been, and not just, Catholic, not just Catholic priests, but all clergy, had been exempted from a mandated reporting law. How many people here have had, during their careers, had licenses from the state, certified from the state? Okay, look at all of you. Okay, if any of you had come in contact with anyone who said that child has been abused. You were mandated to pick up the phone and call the police. And if you didn't, teacher, nurse, um, teacher, nurse, medical personnel, anything, psychologist, if you had any reasonable sense that that child, you had to report it. And if you didn't, your license was in question. In many states, that law mandated reporting clergy. Not in Massachusetts. That had never been reported. So if that law had been in effect, every time a priest had been accused and the archdiocese had been told, the archdiocese would have been forced to call the police, and that would have ended it. The priest felt that, hey, in the way one priest told me, he said, listen, Steve, we're all having affairs, but if I, and I know the priest that I'm suspect, suspect on, but if I blow the whistle, whistle on them, are they going to blow the whistle that I'm having a mature relationship with someone who's an adult? He said, so he said, we, we zip it up. So even on the inside, they knew there was something wrong, and they, weren't, they, they were caught from seeing. Wherever you have privacy, wherever you have that, that sort of confidentiality, you know, that's, and it's a breeding ground for, for abuse. So that's and changed now? Say again? That's changed. That's changed now, yeah, the, that, that, that's changed now. You, you still see it, but where you see it is a priest was arrested. Yeah, that's right. That's, but the reason why, because what happens is the, the, the family will call, will call the, the, uh, the, the parish who will call the archdiocese or the diocese who has to call the police. We've got to report that one of our priests did something bad. And if they don't, that, they can be prosecuted. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a safety net that, that, that should have been always in place. So. It's state by state. Mandated reporting is state, state by state. Uh, please, come on, throw, throw some stuff. I, I found it interesting that when the spotlight team was trying to get a handle on this, they finally decided to follow the priests that have been transferred. Yes, that would that be... That was like the key. I, yeah. I found that really interesting. Right, yeah. Who would have thought that an institution that is um, so uh, part of our life of give, uh, doing good and protecting us would have been involved in such well, perniciousness. They they yes, that, that's the cycle. They thought that take him, taking him that and putting him into, else, right. That he would be cured. Well, there's, there shouldn't be two strikes. And that's what the ones that we found. Uh, Did the Globe come out with the John Jay report? Tell me. That Remind me, I'm sorry. The percentage of those uh, people uh, was, uh, it was actually involving, uh, it wasn't pedophiles, it was homosexuality. Yeah, it was going on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure where the chicken or the egg is there. <laughs> 
tell us any issues that the spotlight team might be working on now, or am I going to have to wait and read about it? I think you got to wait, boy. Uh, <laughs> talk about <laughs> Think When I walk in, even now. <laughs> nice weather. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you again, Steve. <laughs> but, you know, um, the, the last they did was on race in Boston, which I think was good in the sense that they just got us talking about it and saw some numbers that I hadn't seen before. Um, but it, it just still troubles me that we, on that one major, um, Mike Barnacle, who you know, had a had a terrific career as a writer, but was found to be making up a lot of stuff. Uh, <laughs> said, "There's only one issue in America: the stock market, employment goes up and down. There's only one issue, and that's race. And that's the unfairness that uh, that a, a great percentage of our people uh, suffered during a time. You know, and then we can go, but we never talked about it." You know, uh, and even that series didn't talk about, well, wait a second, you know, how much affirmative action, how much uh, 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 extra resources are we going to have to give before that, that community begins to rise on its own, when, when, before it's baked? And that's a good discussion, um, but let's have it, let's have it, let's talk about the suffering, or the, what slavery meant, what the Jim Crow laws meant to this country to figure out whether or not, um, where, where the resources should be spent. It's just, it's just ridiculous that 90% of our shootings in Boston are in the minority community. How is that so? How do I read one or two paragraphs, except for that one in uh, Orchard Park a couple of weeks ago where the, the, the high school, the kid was about to be graduated from college. You know, how is it there's such randomness of violence there? You know, and why can't we do something about it? Right. 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 As a violent place. Yeah, right. I know that. And, and she has every right to be because why did we, why did the issue of um, uh, African American month, January, only become real to us when someone within the Boston Police Department named their idea was Red Auerbach? I don't know if you caught up with that controversy, but we were, you know, black, you know, black leaders were really upset. Well, I'd be upset too if I were a black man and my father, who was a well-known artist, didn't have a chance to be named one of these as, one, as a black leader. You know, come on, there are black teachers as a hero. You know, black representatives, are, uh, give their names, get their names out there. We're not doing a very good job, a PR job, in telling members of our community who deserve renown, hey, they may not be president, they may not be uh, owning a company, but they're still, uh, they're still doing good work. They're still acting as good as citizens. So, so if, Christine, am I all right? Do you want me to keep going? Let me see. Uh, the future of the free press. A future of free press. Yep. Yeah, I think we will continue to get our news. We'll be, expect a cadre of people to be out there giving us information about what's going on in government. But I do think that. Um, that the, you need to speak up to us in the media to tell us what's going on in your community. And, you know, uh, you, you, uh, you, know how to, you know how to call when your trash isn't collected. You know how to call when, you, when your uh, Social Security check doesn't get. You know where to call, right? Well, when your paper is not covering your neighborhood, 
you pick up the phone and find that fo- the number for the Attleboro Sun and say, I want to talk to someone who covers Norfolk or Millis or whatever. And uh, I just want to tell you what's going on down here. And it deserves a story. I think it deserves a story. And they, they'll respond. Yeah, we are very, we are v- very act pro- responsive to the community. So I don't, but I don't think, I think the, the problem will be where we won't invest in long-term investigative reporting. And uh, that'll be left to scandals. And that's, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. So, my friend? Well, I'm thinking more on the, uh, I, I know you're off from local, but on the national. I Please. One of the problems with them is it's been commercialized. You've got big corporations owning the, the news companies. I would assume at one time yep. the news was supposed to be a public service. Yes, in fact, they are. They are public. They still, still consider themselves public. The corporations and they're looking for ratings. Right. Right. And, but they're just, they're just attending to us on their side. And we don't get the fullness of the news. Why am I going on Fox? Why do I have to go on Fox to get what the other side is saying? I need some fair reporting. Fuller reporting, not fair, but fuller reporting. But cable is so split, I mean, segmented, that they're each trying to get their share of the audience. Yes. That they've got a guaranteed Fox, MSNBC, CNN, has, they don't want to lose that. So they may not gain audience, but they don't want to lose what they've got. So they try to focus to what they're... You know what this is? Write a letter. Yeah, but then you have Sinclair Broadcasting that owns all of these different stations, and they're controlling information. Yeah. And then you have cuts being made to public broadcasting, radio, and television. That's preventing information from coming to the people. Right, right. Well, I, I, I think the cuts are not going to be felt until you do it at the local level. That's the, that, that's the problem. Until you can show that these cuts have an effect that you're, you're, you're reading your, um, your, your um, test scores, uh, your MCAS scores. It's not MCAS anymore, is it? Yeah. Is it MCAS still? Uh, when you see that, hey, what the hell? My grandkids, my kids, they're not getting what my kids got, you know, and I'm still paying top dollar for my taxes. Uh, I want to know why. And so it's up to us, <laughs> you know, the squeaky wheel, as our mothers told us. Uh, locally, there's a paper called The Country Gazette that um, we really like, and we used to have it delivered right to our driveway. And every Thursday, they throw it in our driveway. Nice. And it, it's out of Milford, but they cover yep. different areas. Right. Lo- and it's local news. And they cover, they cover Norfolk? Yeah. Yeah. They cover Norfolk and Rentham and yep. you know, Bellingham and the whole area. What happened to the country gazette? So, I called and I said, what happened? Yeah, and where are we? Thursday, and all of a sudden, it, it stopped. <laughs> Do we remember this? Said, you know why we don't deliver? I said, yeah, tell me why. Yeah. Because President Trump had the cost of paper now, I guess something with, with uh, paper. Newsprint. Has gone up so much. Yeah, yeah, right. They can't afford to do home deliveries anymore. So they, you can go to a store. Oh, I see. Uh, Are they online? They're, uh, no. They're not online. No. Yeah. But they said we can't afford to give you. The cost of the newspaper yeah. has gone up so much. Did you pay for it? Was it subs- no. do, were you a subscriber to it? It was free. But now when you go to the store, do you. Do you well, you have to go to the store yeah. where they have. I see. I see. But we stopped having it delivered long before Trump had anything to do with Trump. Well, we just us, it was just recently. recently. Yeah, no, mine has been for several years. But they stopped. No, for. Oh. Yeah. Well, we're gonna let tr- we won't let I won't let Trump off the hook on that. <laughs> Don't get us started. What? Give me that again. Speak up. Foxborough Reporter Office has closed, and it's now part of the Sun Chronicle. It's not. So we don't even have an office in Foxborough anymore. They do not. Well, that's too bad. It's a, such a thriving community, you know. That's too bad. My friend? I think maybe part of the problem is that the 
cable broadcasters, the news broadcasters, have no one of sub or no one who is seen as a substance. There are no more Cronkites. There are no more Brinkleys. I hear you. There are no more Huntleys. Yeah. There is no one who speaks with authority. Yeah. There is no Edward R. Morrow. I, I know. You can stop a country yeah. by saying, have you no yeah. decency? You bring tears to my eyes, my friend. When you think of those names yeah, and, their, well. and, their, uh, now, and their impact. And, and now they're just pretty faces. Yeah, yeah. With, with no journalistic yeah. jobs. Well, I don't go too far. I hear you. You know, I hear it's, you. It's, it's appearance. Yeah. It, it's not substance. Yeah. Uh, in the newspaper, in, in the print realm, there are no Bernstein and Wood. Yeah. yeah. They're there. They're there. Uh, there's, you know, the, the perception. The, 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 good for you, perception. My fear is, is that uh, people won't be going into the business as much as they had because of the, uh, you can make more money. It's always, always that way. Uh, but at one point in time, going into the media, you could have a major effect on your community. Like for me, the fairness factor, or like for Woodward and Bernstein, that you know, you, you're getting paid well. Uh, but it's not that way. It's not that way, the money is not, you know, I, I don't, my, my son became a sports reporter and he's right now thinking about leaving the business and because it's just the opportunity isn't there. I said, well, they passed the sports betting bill. Maybe there's money, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> be a better handicapper, Adam. <laughs> no, thank you. Very good. I have to leave. I'm going to left field of Fenway Park. Thank you, Christine. And thank you very much. Yeah.